Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mi++ seminar. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Peter Oliver from the University of Minnesota, who will talk about reassembly of broken objects. Over to you, Peter, please. All right. Thank you very much, Vitaly, and thank you for the invitation to give a talk in, in the seminar and to be virtually in Liverpool, where some of my relatives live. So I have, a, I have direct connections with Liverpool and I've been there many times over the years. Um, so I wanted to talk about some recent and less recent work on what I call reassembly of broken objects. Um, let me see. There we go. Okay, so these are the sort of things I'll I'll, I'll uh, get into details in a second. So the plan of the talk is to first give a dis overall description without much mathematics as to what we've been doing, and then to get into some of the mathematics uh, in the second part of the talk. And uh, please ask questions as I go along. I uh, uh, we can do this. So so here's a a puzzle we solved. Uh, so the first part where we did this was I worked with an undergraduate named Dan Hoff, and the goal was to solve what we call a pictorial jigsaw puzzles, and particularly those with unusual shapes. So this is one we really liked and we were able to solve. It's called the Baffler Nonagon. Um, it has uh, 67 pieces, and if you look at it a bit, I'll show you a better picture in a second, you see the shapes are all very unusual, but there's no picture. So a pictorial means we're not making use of any pictures on the puzzles, unlike what you do with traditional jigsaw puzzles. So here's the pieces that Dan uh, scanned in, the, the 67 or 69. It says 67 on the box, but it's actually 69, so I don't understand that. And I think you can still get this on Amazon if you're if you're a puzzle aficionado as Dan was. And so in with the algorithms that I'll describe towards the end of the talk, we were able to solve this completely, uh, taking the digitized pieces back here and put them together uh, in under an hour on a laptop. So this is Dan Hoff, who's gone on to work in other areas. This was when he was an undergraduate student. He, OK, and this is what it looks like in real life if you solve it all together. You notice the interesting thing is the pieces are shaped unusually. So we're going to make use of that. And also the boundary is not completely square. So there's no information about the boundary used in the algorithms. So after we did that and some other puzzles and wrote a paper, I sent it to some people uh, working in uh, who had done work in jigsaw puzzles at, earlier. In particular, I sent it to a fellow named Marshall Byrne, who worked in, uh, used to work in Xerox Park uh, back in the 70s. And he wrote back and he, he, he said he liked the paper. And he said, I have some uh, digitized eggshell, uh, eggshell pieces that I've never been able to do much with. So maybe your algorithms could work in 3D. So I, I call this putting Humpty Dumpty together again. In other words, uh, reassembling a broken eggshell. And these are some of the people that worked with it, including my wife, Cherry Shakiban, and former PhD student of mine, Rob Thompson, and some undergraduates. And so these are the ones that Marshall Byrne had scanned. So this was the one that he had wanted to put together and never succeeded. So we did some work and we got pretty good using sort of 3D version of the same algorithms to doing uh, uh, synthetic 3D eggshells. So in other words, we took ellipsoids and chopped them up into pieces, randomly rotated, translated the pieces before trying to put them back together. And that did reasonably well. The actual pieces, we sort of did well. Um, but the problem was that they, A, a couple of the pieces were very badly scanned, and B, the edges were not nearly as nice because of the scanning resolution. So with some hand holding, we were able to kind of put it back together, but there's still uh, uh, much remains to be done in the 3D case. And here's an interesting case where you might do it in practice. This is the so-called elephant bird of Madagascar. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. The elephant bird was much, much bigger than an ostrich. So the, the, the red one is an ostrich, the purple one is an elephant bird. They came ex became extinct in Madagascar, maybe by the 1700s. And there are many egg pieces all over the island and people put them together. So I'm not gonna show this. This is a, 
a video of a very young David Attenborough putting together an, an elephant bird egg. And you can even make money. Do so there goes the video, but I'm not going to play it because it takes a while. Uh, but you can find it on YouTube if you type in that. And in fact, you could, in principle, you can even make money of this. A, a reassembled egg sold on auction at uh, Sotheby's, I think it was, uh, for $100,000. So there you go. <laughs> and the, it's also of interest in archaeological excavations. Here's an article from the BBC, from, no, an Israeli paper about putting together uh, chicken egg from biblical times and, and helping understand the diet of uh, the, the uh, Jewish people at that time. So after you do eggs and jigsaw puzzles, there are, of course, all kinds of other broken objects. Uh, one, of, one of them is, it, a lot of them are in archaeology, say, putting together pots like this. Uh, you can also think of putting together broken bones, uh, doing automatic surgery. So that's a very interesting thing. Here's an example also from biology of putting together histological sections in something called an auto stitcher. Um, so about that time, I, I get connected up with a group of researchers here at the University of Minnesota working in anthropology, and they were very interested in putting together broken bones, not for surgical reasons, but to, to understand particularly old human sites. So, so I will describe a bit of what we've been doing here. There's still a lot remaining to be done and is actively under development at the moment, but particularly Katrina Yetzi Woodley, who was a PhD student at the time, now she's a postdoc uh, here, was, was the one that was very instrumental in getting me involved in this. So the idea was to try to use the methods from jigsaw puzzles to understand putting together broken bones. Uh, there's a second group, but Minnesota, of course, these these studies are not just of Minnesota, in putting together Stone Age tools, what are called lithics. So they're very interested in understanding this is more recent human development of how they how they made Stone Age tools and how they got put how you and that's done by understanding how you put the pieces back together. So for this tool, you would chop off bits from the rock to make it sharp, and then you but the bits are still lying around and you can try to put them together. Um, as a result of this, we formed a consortium that we named AMAZE for Anthropological and Mathematical Analysis of Archaeological and Zooarchaeological Evidence. So we got the right acronym. And you can, you can see some of our activities at the AMAZE website. There's a large group of people here. This is an animation. This is not actually a, this was a by hand animation, not using the software. And so there's the AMAZE website. And these are the people who are involved in broken bones, particularly Jeff Calder, who's expert in machine learning in my department, Martha Tappan, who's, uh, who was Katrina's uh, PhD advisor and others, are, and a large number of uh, undergraduate and even high school students and also graduate students. And so when you're trying to do this, there's various steps in the method. So there's the first step of how you scan in the bones in the first place and get surface models, meshing them. And I'm not gonna go into that, but we've, we've also written papers on protocols for doing that. And then a big question is where are the uh, faces on the bone? In other words, segmentation. So this is a more challenging problem than typical image segmentation because you're having to segment a surface and also they're fairly rough. But we've done some, we, ha we haven't written all of this up, but we've, we have some good algorithms for segmenting based on various types of invariants. Uh, here's one done by an undergraduate student. This is using semi-supervised Poisson learning. Um, so the, the little spheres you see are the points that are where you're told which face, each, each point is in a face, and then the algorithm using semi-supervised Poisson learning determines the faces. So it does a reasonably good job. This one is pretty good. Uh, this one is a little less good because if you see as it turns around, you'll see that some bits are, yeah. So if you look on that green face, there's a little bit of yellow creeping in. There's a bit of magenta in that blue face. So anyway, that's sort of preliminary studies for the segmentation. And then for the refit problem, uh, we're still working on this. We still don't have good algorithms, but here's one the, uh, uh, one of our graduate students developed. It's based on gradient descent on a on an objective function that that is 
So it relies on the segmentation and it uses the break edges and the surface normals and tries to match those up. So it does a reasonably good job. We don't have it at a stage yet where we can handle large numbers of bones and sort these out, but at least there's, there's some encouraging work here. Okay. Uh, what, let me just briefly say before we get to the math, why they're interested in this. So the group in Minnesota is very interested in ancient hominin sites. So the most famous one, of course, is Olduvai Gorge, which is in, uh, in Tanzania, uh, in Africa. And that's about 1.9 million years ago. Uh, there's an even older one down in South Africa called the Cradle of Humankind. And then there's a very interesting one in the Republic of Georgia that's been dated to be 1.8 million years ago. So this is not that much younger than the African sites. And the before this was found, the hypothesis was that human beings didn't come out of Africa until they were very well developed. Uh, so this is way before thing, things like, uh, of course, Homo sapiens, but also other, other things, Neanderthals and some of the other ones, Australia, uh, sorry, other, other ones. So these, these are very ancient humans, and it's still not well understood what they were doing in Georgia and what was going on. And there's various things to look at that. So the, so the questions are, how do the fragments go back together? Who broke them? And the re, so this is, this is an example. So the questions we're interested in, we have the fragments. Uh, there's which animal it came from. And there are, all, of course, animals that were around at that time that we no longer have. And then how were the fragments broken? Were they broken by humans or were they broken by other animals? And in our work, we have a, we've assembled a large collection of fragments that we broke so we know exactly how they were done. And most of the work nowadays, although I won't go into the details, has been based on machine learning uh, on the individual fragments. And we're getting reasonable results, although not as compelling as one might like. So the question is, given the fragment, can you tell whether it was broken by a human uh, using Stone Age methods or broken by a hyena uh, we have uh, hyenas of the Milwaukee Zoo and the Eau Claire Zoo that are broken fragments for it, or broken by, say, dropping rocks on them, sort of mimicking geological uh, methods. And the hypothesis in the field is that the geometry of the bone fragments, so things like angles, shapes of faces, so on, uh, and their identity and how they're reassembled, they will tell us who broke them. And the reason that's important is that it has implications about what early humans were doing. So when did we become meat eaters as opposed to most of the great apes, which are vegeta mostly vegetarian? Uh, there's a whole hypothesis about how meat eating led to brain development. There's also the question of how did we acquire the meat? Did we scavenge from when other, other carnivores had killed the animal or did we actually hunt them themselves? So in the former case, the bones will be mostly broken by the carnivores. And in the latter case, they will be broken by humans. And that has implications for social development and other, other such things, cooperative behavior and so on. So there's a whole host of questions that one can understand a bit better based on the uh, understanding the, the bone fragments that have been retrieved from these sites. Okay, there's, here's an interesting article that came out a little while ago. Uh, that said, could the history of humans in North America be rewritten by broken bones? So in California, they found some broken mastodon bones and they ran these sort of algorithms and determined that they had to have been broken by humans, not by animals. And if that's true, then humans appeared in North America at least 100,000 years earlier than, than is currently estimated, which is around 40,000 years ago. So that would have major implications, but this, this study turned out to be a bit flawed. It turns out that the bones were broken by humans, but they were broken because during the development of the site, some heavy equipment ran over them and broke them while they were sitting in the dirt. So that's uh, that's still up in the air. Okay, so unless there, are there any questions about what I've said so far before I go into the mathematics of, of what we're doing? Okay, so very far, good. Fine, thank you. Okay, very good. So, so let me let me start describing to go back to the beginning. So this is how I got into this. 
And one of the things that I've been very interested in is what's known as the equivalence problem. So we have some sort of transformation group. I'll give you examples in a, in a second, acting on a space. So these are, these are usually uh, pretty, pretty basic geometrical transformations, say rotations, translations, and so on. And you have two objects. So you can think of those as puzzle pieces or broken bones or curves or surfaces. And when can they be mapped one to the other by a group element? Okay, so that's the basic equivalence problem. And if you're interested in symmetry, which is one of my main areas of research for many years, the symmetry of the subset is just a self-equivalence. In other words, it maps the subset to itself by a group transformation. So if you understand the equivalence problem, you've also solved the problem of symmetries. Okay. So for example, here's some good examples. This is rigid equivalent. So rigid motions are translations and rotations. So I have two shapes. And the question is, how can I tell whether I can map one shape to the other by a rigid motion? Now, of course, there's some sort of naive methods that one can use and are used, is you just try all possible rigid motions and see if you can get the one that best matches the two shapes. And if they match exactly, then you found it. So I'm going to use, I'm going to do a, something a bit more sophisticated than that, um, and uh, this, of course, other group scaling group, so similarity equivalence, uh, and then if you if you're looking at two D objects but you're allowed to maneuver them in three dimensional space, the group that's underlying this is the so called projective group. So you think of that object on the on the left and it's been rotated, so it's the same object, but it's tilted at an angle. And the question is, can you recognize that? So this is a larger group acting on planar objects. Uh, it turns out the projective group, as we'll see in a second, is, is a bit too large. It's, there's too much in it to work. But if you restrict to what's called the equiaffine group, so this is the group of affine area preserving transformations, that's a good approximation and works quite well. So. So one of the motivations for, for incorporating symmetries into your image processing problems is that our brain has certain symmetries somehow built in. There's a good question of why we, we have this, and, and there are sort of evolutionary explanations for this that may or may not work. But, but to see how we have these in, suppose I give you this cup of coffee and I ask you, what's the shape of the rim of the cup? And of course, if you didn't think about it at all, you just say circular. But of course, it's not circular. Your brain is seeing this as an ellipse. And somehow you, your eye, I mean, is seeing this as an ellipse. And somehow your brain is taking that ellipse and making, uh, making it circular. So there's somehow projective geometry being built into our brain, or at least to a certain extent. Uh, here's another example from some older work of mine of, of recognizing whether tennis rackets are equivalent under projective or equiaffine transformations, and also symmetries. You might be interested in the bilateral symmetry of that tennis racket. For the, for the uh, left-hand view, the symmetry is not so hard to detect. For the right-hand view, it's much more challenging because it's, a, it's not just a reflection, it's a projective type of reflection. Um, so here, oh, we already had that, whoops. Well, oh, sorry, I'm going backwards, that's why. Okay, now there's a famous paper by uh, 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 a Swedish uh, researcher named Ostrom who showed that it's possible to change basically any shape into any other shape by a projective transformation. So he showed you shows how to ch change a duck into a rabbit. And there's, there's the paper from 95. Um, so this is how you do it. So you take the duck shape. I remember the projective one is just like tilting it. So I start tilting the duck and moving it close to my eye. And it's basically almost circular by the one, the one on the left-hand side and the bottom left part. And if you look at that circular uh, curve at the top, there's the, the remnants of the duck is sitting there. But at the bottom, which you didn't see in the original picture, there's a little bit that represents the rabbit. And so then you tilt it the other way and it out pops a rabbit. So modulo noise, anything can be changed into anything. So this is indication of the limits of projective equivalence. And there are other reasons for the limits of that. Um, but there are all, 
even limits of uh, rigid motion, Euclidean equivalence. This is the famous Thatcher illusion, maybe most of you have seen. So, of course, Margaret Thatcher was the prime minister way back in the 1980s when I was when I was in Oxford. Um, so, but you can take your your own least favorite politician or least favorite person and do the same illusion with them. So the way this works is if you start with the original image and then you rotate it by 180 degrees and then you cut out the eyes and the mouth, you rotate those by 180 degrees. So they're the right way up. And at this stage, it looks somewhat reasonable. If you look at it for a while, it looks a little bit strange. But if you then take the the last image and rotate that by 180 degrees, you get something that looks totally bizarre. So, so somehow our brain is saying these are rigidly equivalent, but we can't go too far. So just like the projective motion, if you go too far away from the identity, then you get things that are not equivalent. And this leads to something that I'm not going to talk about here, but I've been thinking about is what is the right language for doing these local equivalence and symmetry problems, which is really what we should be doing. And the right language I convinced is not group theory anymore, but groupoids. Uh, but I, I don't want to go into that because I, I have not yet used that in any significant way. Okay. So here's the pro one of the problems we're particularly interested in. So if we want to do equivalence of puzzle pieces, of course, now we don't want to do the equivalence of the entire boundary. We just want to do equivalence of part of the boundary. So at some stage, the algorithms have to take into account the locality of the matching. And so when you do this, of course, you do something like that. But you're matching the, the orange curves and the blue curves don't matter until you, you get to the next puzzle piece and try to do that. OK, so. The algorithms that I'm going to talk about, they're not the only ones that are out there, but the ones that I, I particularly like because they give a solution to the equivalence problem are all based on what are known as differential invariants. So think of a curve or a surface in R3, say. A differential invariant is just a, an invariant of the action of G on the derivatives of it. So the first, second, and third derivatives on it. And you know there are, there are very basic geometric examples of differential invariance, but this is an entire theory that goes back to Sophus Lee when he first invented Lie groups. Um, so the, the, the main example everyone knows is the curvature of a curve. So this is the reciprocal of the radius of the osculating circle. So the, the red is the magenta is a curve, and the blue is the osculating circle. It's the closest approximation. Uh, generically, although we, we never seem to graph it that way, and when we talk about osculating circle, generically the curve goes from the inside to the outside of the circle. Um, so that's the simplest differential invariant for the rigid motion group, the Euclidean group. Um, and then there's a theorem that says that one can actually construct a complete list of differential invariants from the curvature and the arc length. So the arc length element, ds, so this is the usual arc length we teach in calculus, is an invariant one form, and its dual is an invariant differential operator, namely differentiation with respect to arc length. And the classical theorem says that a complete list of diff Euclidean differential invariants are kappa and its derivative with respect to arc length and higher derivatives. So in other words, any differential invariant can be locally written as a function of, of these invariants. Now, it turns out that this is this theorem is not unique to the Euclidean group. In fact, there's an analogous theorem for any group action on any space, and one if one considers smooth submanifolds of the space, one can get a complete list of differential invariants. So here are the formulas, just in case. So kappa is second order, the usual formula for curvature. There's the formula for the derivative of curvature with respect to arc length. ds is given at the bottom line d by ds is given just by the dual operator and so on. So these are all local. They are successively higher and higher order. OK. Um, if you go to the equiaffine group, so this is the group of affine area preserving transformation. So it's a semi-direct product of the special linear group. In other words, the matrices of determinant 1, 2 by 2 matrices of determinant 1 with the translations. There's also a, a fundamental differential invariant that's known as the equiaffine curvature. Although I should warn you, in a lot of the mathematical literature, this is called affine. 
but the full affine group has also scaling, and that's a divot. That I didn't write down that, but there's an analogous theorem for that. But anyway, for the equiaffine group, the equiaffine curvature is of order four. The equiaffine arc length is this cube root of the second derivative of u. This is assuming, of course, the curve is given by u is f of x. So there's the derivative with respect to equiaffine arc length. And one has exactly the same type of theorem. So once you know the equiaffine curvature and the arc length, you get all the higher order invariants coming out of that. Okay. And if you did want to do projective group, the formulas are known, but they're horrendously complicated. The projective curvature is a seventh order differential invariant. In other words, it depends on the seventh order derivatives of the function. And the projective arc length is a fifth order. And but one still has the same theorem. So if everything was nice and smooth, there was no noise, one could, one could use this for determining, as we'll see, equivalence under projective group. But of course, the noise and the work of Ostrom says that this is tricky at best and uh, computationally just too involved. So this is why the projective group is not used nearly as much. Um, could could yes. ask a question here? Sure. Um, I guess there are also completeness results about place and variance. Uh, say... That's right. So, the, so these theorems are all special cases of a very general theorem that I'll I'll mention in a second. Mm, okay. So, so yeah, it's like a, in algebra you have something called the Hilbert basis theorem. This is a basis theorem for differential invariance. Okay. Let me let me do two. Uh, two other cases. One is the Euclidean space curve. So these are curves now in R3. This is the, what is used in the reassembly of the eggshells. So the, the ones for the reassembly of the 2D jigsaw puzzles is just the, the, the Euclidean curvature. But if you go to space curves, curves in three dimensions, there's not only the curvature, there's also the torsion. So we learned that. That's a third order differential invariant. There's also the arc length, the expression is slightly different, but one still has a completeness result. The curvature and torsion and their derivatives with respect to arc length are a complete set of differential invariants. So in other words, one can generate all the differential invariants of space curves from these two fundamental invariants. Um, Peter, by, by, completeness, sorry, by completeness, I meant uh, that uh, our invariants distinguish all non-rigidly equivalent curves. Right, right. So that, that'll come in the theorem. So in the solution to the equivalence problem, I'll state this this will come. So at the moment, I'm just interested in classifying the differential invariants, but then I'm going to use them Okay. soon. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Vital. Um, and then in the case of Euclidean surfaces, when you do differential geometry of surfaces, you learn about two, two basic differential invariants, the mean curvature and the Gauss curvature. There are now two invariant differential operators. They're not quite the covariant derivatives. They're something, but they're, they're well known. And in fact, one has a similar completeness result that the Gauss and mean curvature generate. So this is again, a classical result, generate all the differential invariants through invariant differentiation. And then about 15 years ago, while I was working on, uh, actually it was a problem inspired by Peter Giblin and, Liverpool, when he was visiting Minnesota, he asked me about the differential invariance of the 3D equiaffine group. And I went back to this result in 3D geometry of surfaces, just Euclidean geometry. And I discovered much to my surprise and his surprise that, the, that you actually only need the mean curvature. There is a universal formula for generic surfaces that expresses the Gauss curvature in terms of the mean curvature and its derivatives. So this is very interesting. And I've, I've been continuing to try to understand this and more general cases of this. So, so one can often get away with smaller number of invariants, even when classical results give you certain information. OK, so this is the general theorem. And then we'll get to the equivalence problem in a second. So this so-called basis theorem goes back to Lee. In the case of finite dimensional Lie groups, there's also a version for infinite dimensional Lie pseudogroups, which don't play a role here, but do in other work. Um, and it says that no matter what the group is, the differential invariance, there's a finite number of generating invariants. And exactly P, which is the dimension of the submanifold, invariant differential operators. So remember, we had arc length derivative for curves, so P was 1. 
and two in the case of surfaces, P was two and so on in such a way that you can generate all the differential invariants that way. And so, so I did some work, first of all, in the Lee group case with one of my postdocs, Mark Fells, and then later for the pseudo group case with one of my uh, uh, former students, Yuhar Pokian Pelto, and we gave completely constructive versions of this theorem. So using a theory of moving frames, which will be a whole not other talk in itself, we know how to construct these generating invariants. So these classical results can all be recovered and many other new results have been recovered using this method of moving frame. So we can ex exactly write down a set of differential invariants and other things, integral invariants, invariant signatures and so on, invariant numerical algorithms and so on and so forth using this method. So it's a very powerful calculus for understanding invariants and in particular for constructing what I would call the signatures for the equivalence problem. Okay, so now let me go back and now let's think back of the, of the puzzle pieces or the basic problem of equivalence of say curves or surfaces. So suppose I have two submanifolds, say two curves in Euclidean space, then obviously because the invariants are not affected by the group, if they're equivalent, they have to have the same invariants differential invariance, but any other type of invariant, they have to be the same. If the invariance is, is constant, then immediately get information. So for instance, if the curve had curvature two everywhere, in other words, it's a circle of radius a half, then any equivalent curve has to also have constant curvature two. In other words, also is a circle of radius a half, which is obvious of course, but, but that's a part of the general result. Now, the interesting thing is what happens if the, the curvature is not constant and you've parameterized the curve either by u is f of x or by some other means, just because you have the curvature of the one curve given by x cubed and the other curve given by whatever, just because these are different functions doesn't say anything about whether the curvatures are, are, can be matched to each other because the, the, it depends on the parameterization. So how do you get around the parameterization? And this was Carton's insight. Uh, you look at the dependencies among the among the differential invariants. So if one curve happened to be the derivative of kappa with respect to S happened to be kappa cubed minus one, because kappa S and kappa are both invariants, any other equivalent curve has to have essentially exactly the same relation among its invariants. Now, these dependencies come in two types. So you don't see these for curves, but there are certain universal syzygies or universal dependencies. The simplest one in differential geometry is the so-called gauss kadatsi relations that show up in surface theory. And then there are the ones like this that depend on the curve or the surface that you're doing. And these are what I call the distinguishing syzygies or di distinguishing dependencies. And then Carton in the early part of the, the 20th century prove the following fundamental result, the two regular, so there's a, there's a technical condition of regularity, they're locally equivalent if and only if they have identical dependencies among all their differential invariants. Okay, so this in principle enables us to solve the equivalence problem. However, if you remember, there's an infinite number of differential invariants. Um, so there's an infinite number of these identities that have to be checked to establish equivalence. So that's not computationally efficient, of course. But however, one always has that the higher order differential invariants are always generated by invariant differentiation from a finite number of basic differential invariants. And the higher order dependencies, the higher order syzygies are also consequences. So let me show how that is in the case of curves. So suppose, so then once you understand this, you understand kind of what's going on. Suppose you knew kappa S was some function of kappa. If you differentiate both sides with respect to S and use the chain rule, you get kappa SS is the derivative. So by the chain rule, this H prime of kappa kappa S, but we already know a formula for kappa S. So we get H prime of kappa times H of kappa. So once we know the formula for kappa S in terms of kappa, we automatically know the formula for its derivative and we can repeat this. And so basically this formula, the starred formula de 
determines the dependencies among all the higher order differential invariants. So we only need to do that. So this result of Cartan, it's a little hard to dig out of Cartan, but it's in there. Cartan is very difficult reading, even if you know French. Um, but I reformulated in the following way. So the fact that we only need to know this says that what we should do is look at what I call the signature curve. So if we have a plane curve and we're looking at the action of a group, say the rigid motion group, but it could be the equiaffine group, it could be the preactive group, it should, could be some other group. If we know the fundamental differential invariant, curvature invariant, and its derivative with respect to the fundamental arc length, and we use those to parameterize a curve that I'll call the signature curve, then this uniquely determines the equivalence problem. In other words, it uniquely determines the... So if the curves satisfy some regularity condition, they're locally equivalent if and only if their signature curves are identical. So this enables you to do the equivalence problem without having to try to move one curve and try to match it up with the other one. You just look directly at the signature. And the regularity condition in this case just says that at least one of kappa s and kappa ss is not zero. Uh, if if it's not regular, there are ways of getting around this, but but generically everything's going to be regular, and we're dealing with local uh, equivalence anyway. So let me explore that a little bit. Let me check the time. How we're doing? Oh, good. Um, so here's an example. Here's an original curve. So this is this that's the actual formula for it. So these are ones that are just computed analytically. This curve is almost circular. So if it were exactly circular, the curvature would be constant and kappa s would of course be zero. But because this is almost circular, the signature, so this is a map of kappa versus kappa s, is quite small, is close to a point. And then I won't go into the numerical side of this, but we use, we have some invariant numerical algorithms for computing the kappa and kappa s, because of course in practice, these are just discretized curves. These are coming from images and segmenting images. So you need to compute kappa and kappa s efficiently using numerical algorithms. And we have some very nice numerics for doing that. So that's not, those, those are well, well studied. Okay, so there's a numerical signature an example. Here's an interesting case. Uh, a little more less trivial. Here's the original curve. That's the parameterization. So again, the, these are computed analytically, but one could also do this numerically. Here's the Euclidean curvature versus the Euclidean, the derivative of the Euclidean curvature with respect to arc length. Now, in this case, there is an approximate threefold symmetry of this curve. It's not exact. And so one can use these, you see the approximate symmetry coming because you go three times almost around the same curve. If you went exactly three times around the same curve, that will be an exact symmetry. So one gets symmetries out of the signature as well. And here's the corresponding equiaffine signature. So this axis, the horizontal axis is equiaffine curvature using that fourth order formula that I showed before. And this is the derivative of equiaffine curvature with respect to equiaffine arc length. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tilt this curve. In other words, I'm going to subject it to an equiaffine motion. And you see the Euclidean signature changes dramatically, but the equiaffine signature doesn't change at all. Okay. So we're not so good at recognizing this is a tilted version of that one, but the signature tells you immediately. They're not you. Euclidean equivalent. They're not equivalent up to rigid motion, but they are equivalent under an equiaffine transformation. Okay. So then I sent uh, a student of ours, Steve Haker, to, uh, who, who was on the paper, to go and get some objects. So he went to the local hardware store. Here are the objects. He segmented them and did a bunch of experiments. So here's, for example, two nuts. Um, they have a fourfold rotational symmetry, and you see that in the fact that the signature is basically very close to being four times on top of each other, and the two signatures are quite close together. There's also a reflectional symmetry. Now, the reflections change the sign of kappa s, so what one has to do to get the eightfold reflection, if you include reflections, is you have to fold the signature. You have to basically graph the absolute value of kappa s, and you get the eightfold symmetry. So these guys are quite close. 
Um, just a sec. And here's two different objects that are that are quite far apart. So this was in a more practical vein. Oh, I do have a couple of slides. So symmetry and preserving numerical methods. I won't go into the full details, but basically the idea was to approximate these. So these were done using the numerical calculations of kappa and kappa s. Because the, the differential invariants are invariant, one should approximate them in an invariant way. And these turn out to be better uh, methods. This is in the class of so-called structure preserving numerical algorithms. And the simplest example goes back to the formula from the ancient Greeks of what's called Heron's formula that they used to teach in high school. I don't know if they do anymore. That you can approx you can get the curvature of a circle by this formula involving the semi-perimeter. So, so that semi-perimeter gives you the, the radius of the circle and you take one over that, and that gives you a, an invariant numerical approximation to the curvature. And then there's other approximations to the derivative. Okay, now there's a classic, even more classical result for curves that goes back to, uh, I don't know, somewhere, maybe to Gauss or somebody, uh, that says that the classical signature is you graph kappa as just a function of s. Um, and that uniquely determines the curve, at least locally, up to rigid motion. So this is the classical signature. And this is the differential invariant signature. This is kappa. This is now kappa s. Now, there's several disadvantages of the classical signature. One is that the measure of s depends on the starting point. So if I change the starting point, you're going to translate this curve. And so there's still an ambiguity of the curve. One has, to, one has to choose the same starting point, and that may not be obvious. And particularly if you have an occlusion or you're doing a local equivalent, say, of the puzzle pieces, the classical signature splits up into different parts, and you're only given the parts. You're not given where they are in the graph, whereas the differential invariant signature, except for the bits that are covered up, it's exactly the same. So this, this seem, seems that it, it does have a much more robust to occlusions and other things that go on with the curve. So the advantages of this signature curve is purely local. There's no ambiguities with respect to the starting point for arc length. You get also much easier to detect symmetries and approximate symmetries. Even more so that if you want to do surfaces, there's no analog of this theorem about kappa as a function of s when you get to surface theory, because there is no analog of arc length for surface. There's no such distinguished parameterization of a surface. Uh, there are distinguished parameterizations, but none of them are completely invariant. So, But this extends naturally through the work of Carton to higher dimensional submanifolds and then the partial matching. The main disadvantage of the signature is the noise sensitivity due to the dependence on high order derivatives. And we've been, we've done in other work looking at things like integral invariance that I don't have time to go over in this talk to get past the noise sensitivity. Um, so here's generalizations of the signatures that come up in 3D for Euclidean space curves. One only needs kappa, kappa s, and tau. You might think you'd need tau s, but it turns out once you know these three, you can determine the formula for tau s in terms of the fundamental invariance. So this is a, a space curve problem. So this was used in the reconstruction of the broken eggshells. And then in principle, but we haven't done this yet. Uh, in fact, it looks like this may, may not be the right way to do the 3D broken bone reconstruction person, but it, reconstruction problem. But in principle, you can use either this signature that involve, involves uh, mean and Gauss curvature, or there's an alternative using just the Gauss, just the mean curvature alone that will reconstruct it. So the numerics and the application of this still remains to be done. All right, let me in the last, where are we up to? In the last 10 minutes, leaving, leaving some minutes for questions, let me tell you briefly how we're applying this to the 2D jigsaw puzzle problem. Uh, the eggshell problem is basically an adaptation of this. So the, the algorithm is you digitally photograph and smooth the puzzle pieces. There's some interesting questions how you smooth them because you don't want to get you don't want to smooth using a standard curve smooth smoothing algorithm because that gets rid of the corners too rapidly. So we had our own smoothing algorithm for this and I'm happy to go into details with anyone who's interested. Then you numerically compute the invariant signatures of 
parts of the pieces. So you again, you don't want to match the entire edge. You want to just match it. And then you compare the signatures to find potential fits. If you find a good fit, you put those two pieces together, and then you repeat until the puzzle is assembled or the algorithm breaks down. OK, and how do we localize? So this was the idea we had. So if you remember those signatures way back then, let me briefly go back here. Yeah, these ones. Notice the signature winds around and around and around. So there's lots of pieces. So one way to localize is to just look at the arcs where it goes from the kappa axis and back to the kappa axis. So look at the, each of those individual arcs. So we call those a bivertex arc because its endpoints are what are known as vertices in curve theory, where kappa s is zero. And so we take, so the whole signature is a, a collection of many of these bivertex arcs, and we just split them up individually. That's easy to do. And then we're gonna compare the signatures of the bivertex arcs for potential matches. So we split up the curves into bivertex arcs and then generalize vertices, which are either points or could be straight lines or circles. And the idea is to compare the individual bivertex arcs. So this was the first paper Dan Hoff and I wrote before he went on to apply it to the jigsaw puzzles. It explains the algorithm. And then, of course, the question is, how do you compare these bivertex arcs? So there's many notions of comparison, Hausdorff, uh, optimal transport, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the one that we found the most useful is what we called electrostatic or gravitational attraction. And so the idea is that you look at the, you consider the signature curves as masses, or if you prefer, oppositely charged wires, and then you look at their mutual attraction. And the higher that is, the closer they are together. And in any way, we're dealing with discrete data and numerics based on that. So we're actually not dealing with curves, we're just dealing with points. So it's just the gravitational attraction or electric attraction between uh, collections of points. And that turns out to be very, very good for noting, for figuring out the higher it is, the closer they are together and the more likely you have a match. And then we started to get reasonable results. Uh, but you see, if you make small errors, if you look at the left-hand side, if you start making small errors, the errors rapidly accumulate and you can't go any further when you're assembling the pieces. So Dan came up with a method that he called piece locking, which was basically taking a good match and making it even better by jiggling it around. And he did some sort of similar uh, physics-based idea to minimize the force and torque based on gravitational attraction of the two matching edges. So in other words, you treat the edges as well as, well as, as, uh, as masses and you try to minimize their the forces. And that turns out to work very well. So these bad matches turn into good matches and one can continue. So with that, Dan started to come into my office increasingly often. Oh, I've got two pieces put together. Oh, I got three pieces put together. Oh, I got seven pieces put together and boom, boom, boom. And within less than a month, he had the whole thing assembled. So that's the picture I already showed. We did some other puzzles. This is actually more challenging. This is a more traditional puzzle. It has a picture on it, but we didn't make any use of the picture. The picture is of a rainforest. And there is the reassembly of that. That takes a little bit longer, but we had to do it. We sent the paper off to be refereed, and the referee said, yes, you can do a 67-piece puzzle, but what about a 670-piece puzzle? So we went off, and Dan digitized a 1,000-piece puzzle, and we were, no, it was a yeah, a thousand piece puzzle. And we were able to get about 150 of the pieces put together before the algorithm broke down. So there are limitations. And I think, is that where I want to end? Yeah, we may as well end here. I had some more stuff, but uh, I think we'll end here and I'll open up to questions and maybe we'll see. Thank you very goes. much. Thank you, Peter. Let us thank Peter for the nice presentation, please. <clears throat> Indeed, uh, so questions, we have uh, about 10 minutes for questions. Thank you for leaving the time, Peter. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Peter, please? <clears throat> Peter, could I ask from, a, uh, could I start from a theoretical question? Sure. Um, 
So you mentioned local equivalence several times. Yes. Uh, could you please clarify the exact meaning? Well, the, so there's there's various types. Oh, oh, this is what I was going to do. So while I answer the questions, I'm going to show you this video. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. Uh, so this is a video Dan Hoff put together, and it'll show as you look at it. So those who are not interested in the question could just look uh, how the pieces were assembled and what happened. So if if you look at it, you'll see some red little red curves on it. Those are the bivertex arcs. So those are the things we're actually matching. And the interesting thing is how little of the actual curves we use when we're matching. Okay, so while that's playing, so in answer to the question, so here you see the pieces and so on, and you'll see soon the sort of illustration of what's going on. Um, so local, so global equivalence means that you have two curves and they're matched up completely. So you have one and it completely goes to the other. Now, when you do puzzle pieces, of course, you don't want to match the entire piece. You don't want to know when two pieces are equivalent. You just don't want to know when parts of two pieces can be matched together. Okay. So the locality <laughs> there is is that it's just parts. And if you look carefully at the proof of Cartan, the proof based on the signatures really only guarantees local equivalence. So you could think of two, again, two puzzle pieces. They're locally equivalent where they match, but they're not globally equivalent. So Cartan says that on the bit where they match, the signatures are identical, but the signatures could be very different far away from that. Now, if the signatures are identical everywhere, then there's the question of, do they match completely? And there's some interesting little issues there. For instance, if I took a curve, chopped it up into pieces and reassembled it in a different order, I can arrange to have exactly the same signature. And they're lo locally equivalent everywhere. The two curves are locally equivalent, but they're not globally equivalent. So there's some subtleties between the local and the global that are not completely addressed. And I, I, I guess if you get local equivalence, the only way to do global equivalence is once you've matched locally, is you then see, are the pieces identical or are they just fitting together? So that's, that's kind of what it is. So Peter, uh, you usually consider it closed curves, right? Global. Uh, Close. No, not necessarily. So, so in the applications, yeah, in image processing, they tend to always be closed curves, but that's not necessary for the results to be true. Okay. So, if you consider uh, a curve with open ends, yes, an open curve, um, this local equivalence, um, so th does it still make sense if if you completely match with um, well parts parts of of a closed curve? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's the same. Yeah, it's local equivalent. So you could have a non-closed curve match part of the closed curve, or you could have two non-closed curves that match. Either they're completely the same, or parts of them are the same. But one might be, say, longer than the other one. Mm -hmm. So this equivalence flarium can be stated in the form of that two, two curves of the same uh, invariance, or where they're defined. So maybe uh, from one right. end. Exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. If and only if this uh, partial curves so or open curves are related by rigid motion. That's right, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> right, thank you. Uh, more questions for Peter, please. Peter, let me then ask a more applied question. Uh, you yes. mentioned that uh, everything is discretized. Mm -hmm. so, so your curve is essentially, is it a sequence of points? Yeah, it's a sequence of points. So for curves, the <laughs> curves are much easier to deal with because they're a sequence of points, but they're also in order. So usually you don't give the points in random order. You give them in the order they appear along the curve. Now, as soon as you go to surfaces, that's what makes surfaces so much more challenging. They're a sequence of points, but there's also a mesh involved. It's a triangulation of the surface. And so there's no ordering of the points. You can tell whether points are nearby each other, but there's no 
specific ordering. It's not like it's a, a, a rectangular mesh where you could have the orderings. It's arbitrary. The way they discretized uh, and worked in is in these uh, image image processing protocols is is they're they're basically triangulations. Um, we also work very much in the surfaces when we're doing particularly the machine learning, but also eventually the uh, uh, refitting problem. We work with the normals, so we 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 often compute the normal direction as well. So that's an important component. If you think of if you're putting two two things together, you want the normals to be in the opposite directions. So you don't want, if you're putting two bones together, you don't want one to be fitting inside the other one. So there's a condition. So even though you might have a match like this, the normals wouldn't match up. So it makes sense to also look at where the normals are pointing. So how do you usually find with normals? So the, these are done by, there are standard, if you have a triangulated surface, there are some standard algorithms for approximating the normal direction. You look at a neighborhood of the point and you take some sort of average of the normals of the different triangles. So you assume you have a sufficiently dense uh, discretization and you look at all the triangles in the discretization in the mesh that are near that point. So you specify some radius and that gives you usually a good approximation to the normal. Now, the segmentation algorithms where we're looking for the edges, those are exactly the points at which the normal suddenly changes direction, and you can't get a good approximation for the normal. So mm -hmm. one of the possible ways of segmenting is to look exactly at where the normals are suddenly changing direction. So in other words, rather than being fairly smooth, they suddenly change from one direction to another. Uh, that's not actually the methods we use for the segmenting. We based it on other types of invariants, so-called uh, spherical volume invariant that, that we developed in some other work. Uh, but it, but it, it uses the normal direction as part of it. So that's an important component. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, let me stop the recording and...